Hi, and welcome to another COA webinar with our host, Ash Miner, Financial Advisor at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. This is in a series of COA webinars sponsored by Morgan Stanley and providing a range of financial education to members of the association. Contact information for Mr. Ash Miner is available, as you can see in this webinar. Uh, we will also be pushing this out to association members uh, and posting information in future issues of Frontline. If you have questions for Mr. Ash Miner uh, during this webinar, you can post those questions in the chat section of the GoToMeeting platform. So that should be on the right-hand side of your, uh, of your screens or, or devices. If you have a question, you can send that directly to the group, uh, and we can ask the question later. Or if you want to, you can send it directly to myself or to uh, Ash Miner. So at this time, I wanted to turn this over to Mr. Ash Miner, Financial Advisor of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management who has a, uh, a family connection to the Commission Corps of the U.S. Public Health Service, his father being a retired pharmacist and has grown up around the PHS family and now has a lot of tips and tools for uh, members of the association, especially the junior officers who are out there, to think about how to build wealth to live the life that you love. Mr. Ash Miner, the floor is yours. John, thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you also to the COA for allowing me and Morgan Stanley to partner with you over the years. Uh, for those that were dialed in last week for this webinar, I want to apologize. There was a technical issue on my end that prevented me from connecting as presenter. I recognize uh, many may have uh, altered their schedules to make time for this webinar, and I do want to apologize for any inconvenience that caused you. But again, I do want to thank everyone for being on the call today. I know your time is valuable. And uh, over the next 25 minutes or so, I hope to leave you maybe a little better informed, just to give you some things to think about, and maybe help you avoid a mistake or two, to shore up your financial plan, and to leave you in a better place as you go forward. It's always a pleasure to engage with uh, PHS officers across the country. After all, you are doing to advance the health and safety of our nation, not to mention my own uh, family ties to the Corps, which John touched on. It is a great honor and privilege for me to have this opportunity to help educate and better prepare you as you look ahead to other important chapters of your life and that of your loved ones. To the extent that those chapters involve personal finances, my team and I based in Charlotte, North Carolina are well equipped with a process and resources to provide customized advice and planning strategies to work to maximize your outcomes over the long term. And to that end, I focus my practice on helping officers take thoughtful action in the near term to solidify their financial lives over the long term, to help define realistic goals and, and chart a course to bring those goals to reality, and to have peace of mind in knowing that you've, you've taken wise financial planning actions, or you at least know what those actions are so that you can execute on them in due time. Uh, on this first page here, please do make note of my website, uh, bookmark it, and, and take some time to look around there at some of the content that I've posted. There's a lot of good information on there that's updated regularly. Uh, also, my email and phone number. I invite each of you to reach out to schedule a private conversation if there's something on your mind or if the content I go over today strikes a chord as something you'd like to explore deeper as it pertains to your unique situation. And also, if you'd like to go on to my monthly uh, e-newsletter distribution, it's called Investor Insights. This is just a collection of current articles, educational pieces, and topics of interest relevant to financial planning and a variety of life events. Please send me an email and I can add you to that distribution. Uh, finally, I do recognize many of you handle your own financial planning and or may already be working with an advisor or a financial services firm. Frankly, I commend you if you are. Uh, but please, please consider us a source of information and general guidance. And if you're interested in learning more about how my team here at Morgan Stanley could help you specifically, just please know we're here to help. Uh, though there are Morgan Stanley branches in every U.S. state, my team and I work directly with officers all over the country. So we're here and we're able to help you personally no matter where you're stationed. Um, as John said, just out of respect for your time, I just want to move through the presentation and take questions at the end. So be sure to jot those down to ask at the end or uh, use that chat feature on the side of your screen. So today we're going to talk about some of the key issues associated with establishing an independent financial life 
and mapping out your financial future. Each of you on this call is unique and different people will have different needs at different times. So we're gonna cover a pretty wide range of topics, but I'm not gonna to go too deeply into any one. Uh, again, if you wanna uh, talk on these in more detail uh, or take a closer look at how they uh, uh, impact you specifically, just let me know that. I do wanna make a special note here that some elements of this presentation were designed specifically around the planning needs of millennials those among us born between 1981 and 1996. These are folks that are ages 22 to 37 today. Um, no matter when you were born though, it's a good idea to periodically review and get a refresher on the fundamentals of sound financial planning as you go along in life. I imagine there's some on this call that have kids old enough to fall into that millennial age group, and I'm sure you will be able to reflect back on your own personal experience uh, with some of the subject matter and the historical events that I'm going to touch on in the next few minutes. By the way, if you do have kids in that age group, or you know someone who might find this info useful and pertinent at this stage in their life, please encourage them to listen to the replay. It's going to be available on YouTube. And just by the way, a quick uh, recap, the webinars we've done thus far in the last several months include a retirement income planning, fundamentals of investing, and raising money-savvy kids. Those are all archived there. All right, let's get moving. All right, so very likely, you may be taking a different path through life than the generations that came before you. You grew up with technology and the internet. Many of you experienced 9-11 and two economic and market downturns during your formative or early professional years. Many of you may be dealing with unprecedented amounts of student debt uh, and, and waiting longer to get married. In today's sharing economy, you may have chosen not to buy a car. You may consider the flexibility of renting uh, or rather rather than buying a home and especially because the cost of living is higher than it was for your parents all of this may contribute to a delay in reaching the traditional life milestones that typically trigger thoughts of financial planning instead you may be focused on achieving the financial freedom to do what you want in the next few years whether it's continuing ed your education traveling starting a business, or, or donating your time to a cause that's important to you. Uh, you may be more concerned about having experiences and making a difference than simply accumulating stuff. So your perspective on finances may be different than your parents. And the financial strategies that worked for your parents, they may not work for you. But the foundational aspects of, of mapping out your financial future are the same today as they were for your parents. Planning, budgeting, saving, investing and building good credit. So how do your peers feel when it comes to financial matters? According to a recent survey, people in their 20s no longer consider age or milestones like getting married or buying a house as a, si as a sign of adulthood. Uh, instead, the majority of young Americans say adulthood really begins when they're, when they're feeling financially independent. Okay, when they can find a job, pay, pay your own bills, uh, cover your own rent, and stop relying on your parents for financial support. In this same survey, most respondents said that they weren't life ready upon graduating from high school or college. In fact, 40% said college hasn't prepared them for the real world. And many wished uh, that they had learned more about managing their personal finances while in school, how to invest, how to do taxes, how to manage monthly bills but uh, I will let you in on a little secret. As a whole, your generation is no less prepared to handle personal finances than those who are considerably older. This is not a millennial issue, it's an American issue. In fact, your generation may be a step ahead of the game. 77% of millennials consider themselves to be good savers. And nearly a third of Americans age 18 to 34 are saving at least 10% of their annual income for retirement. And the fact that you're here today, it's a great step in the right direction. So today we're gonna to discuss some of the issues you may be thinking about as you get ready to move out of your parents' household and establish your own financial freedom. We're gonna focus on three key stages of your financial life, planning, creating wealth, and gaining leverage. First, we'll, look, we'll take a look at the initial planning, like defining goals, not just specific financial objectives, 
but deciding what, the kind, what kind of future you really want. Also creating a budget so you can begin to look at your financial life in a more deliberate and purposeful way. Next, we'll talk about, this, about savings and investment strategies that can help you accumulate wealth over time, including the importance of saving and some strategies and accounts that will help you save successfully, and the basics of investing, uh, including uh, formulating an investment strategy with a focus on asset allocation. And third, we'll discuss how to increase your capacity to borrow and to use credit wisely by establishing credit, which will ultimately give you the financial flexibility to pursue many of your goals. And we'll also talk about some of the basics of finding your first home and whether or not you wanna buy or rent. Let's take a look at how we can plan ahead to make the best choices about your finances so you can use your wealth to live the life you envision. First, let's talk about your personal goals. Those that were present at the retirement seminar at COA at the uh, symposium back in Dallas back in June, or those that have tuned into the monthly webinars we've presented the months since, you heard me talk a lot about setting goals. And you may be wondering, what place do personal life goals have in a financial presentation? Well, from my view, this is the only place to start. At their core, all the topics that we discuss are really about helping you get what you want out of life. And that can be pretty tough if you haven't given some serious thought to your greater life goals. Defining these goals as specifically as possible helps you begin to establish priorities. Once you have priorities, you can start thinking about what kinds of trade-offs you're willing to make to achieve your version of success on your own terms. Do you want to buy a house? Do you want to pay your way through medical school, donate to a charity that's important to you, or do you want to set foot on all seven continents? These are all achievable goals, but unless you have substantial wealth at your disposal, you may have to focus on one or two first. Uh, while making these decisions, you're going to want to think about what you want your life path to look like. At some point, you may have to choose one goal over another. Is it worth delaying homeownership to finance a trip to Antarctica? That's something only you can decide, and only if you've really thought through what's important to you. Once you understand what you want, you can start using the available tools to get there. So let's take a look at an, an example just to get things started. So we've got two hypothetical, a uh, hypothetical couple here, Sarah and Michael. Sarah just finished law school. And she found a job as an associate, and Michael has a job in sales. They're recently engaged, and Sarah has just moved into Michael's small one-bedroom apartment. And let's give them some goals. So their short-term goals over the next year or two are to uh, help pay for the cost of their uh, upcoming wedding uh, and honeymoon, uh, buy or lease a more reliable car than Michael's old, uh, old junker, and then also support their local food bank at some level. Intermediate goals over the next three to five years uh, would include move to a larger rental or maybe buy a home of their own, start a family, uh, and make a big dent in their student loans. And let's say that their longer term goals are to start their own business, support their kids through college with minimal debt, and support a comfortable retirement. Now, all of these things are important to Michael and Sarah, but let's make some decisions about what is most important. Let's say their number one short term goal is paying for the wedding. Uh, the top midterm goal is starting a family, followed very closely by a larger space for that family. And then the top long term goal is to retire comfortably with a strong preference for retiring from their own business. Of course, it's gonna be pretty hard to achieve any of your longer uh, term financial goals if you haven't been able to save a few dollars uh, to open an account or to invest. That leads us to the second stage of mapping out a, a path to financial freedom, setting a budget. So while living on a budget may sound like it limits your options, it doesn't have to be that way. The process of setting a budget requires you to set priorities. So a budget is actually a valuable tool for helping you get the things you really want by showing you what it will take to get there. So this slide gives an overview of the basic steps of the budgeting process. I have a very useful uh, budgeting template, by the way, that I'm happy to share. Just send me an email and I'll be happy to share it with you. But let me elaborate on a few of these steps. So, so step one is calculating your income. What I want you to do is add up all the income you receive on a regular basis from all sources 
on a pre-tax basis. In addition to your, your salary, any bonuses, these may include regular gifts, investment income, freelance income, anything like that. Step two, I want you to track your current expenses. Write down everything you spend for at least three months and what you spend it on. By the way, if, if you haven't kept track of this in any other way, you can look at banks, bank statements, debit and credit card statements. These, these things might help. Step three, you need to separate needs and wants in the context of your overall goals and objectives. So divide all these expenses into reasonably broad categories like clothing instead of shoes, hats, coats, scarves, and then divide it and then divide into also your needs or, or fixed expenses over which you have very little control, like health insurance, income taxes, and rent. But also you want to you want to split out the wants. These are the discretionary expenses over which you have great control. Entertainment, restaurants, leisure travel. Remember, certain categories like food and clothing, these are likely to have both the need and a want aspect. Divide the expense and assign a reasonable portion to each column. Considering your needs and wants in the context of your overall goals and objectives will help you to prioritize. Step four here, set your budget. If you're lucky, your expenses already fall short of your income with enough leftover to support your longer term savings needs. If not, you need to make some adjustments. So start with the needs column and determine whether those needs can be met for less money. Can you, you, know, can you find a cheaper car insurance? Uh, do you need to think about getting a roommate? Also determine your priorities within your discretionary spending. Would you trade dining out less, uh, less often for keeping your summer uh, uh, you know, place at the beach? and then replace the spending numbers with target numbers reflecting your new priorities. Finally, step five, stick with it. Monitor your results and adjust if necessary. Track your actual expenses against the budget that you've set for yourself. Try to stay within your targets, but also use the first few months just to monitor your, your results and reconsider the priorities that you have. And remember, your budget may change as your financial circumstances or priorities change. You have to be flexible. All right, so you've all heard that it takes money to make money. To me, that means that you need to save money if you want to create long-term wealth. Uh, now that we've set a budget that's going to allow us to save a little money, let's take a look at, let's, let's take a deeper dive, if you will, into successful saving. So we'll talk about why it's important to save at every point in your life, strategies that will make savings easier, why saving a little bit now is better than saving a whole lot later, and what kinds of accounts you need to establish to manage different parts of your financial life. So to put things in perspective, here are some interesting stats from recent research on financial wellness. Only 42% of people employed full-time are confident they'll be able to retire when they would like to. 66 million Americans have no emergency savings at all. And half of full-time employees said that not having enough emergency savings was one of their top financial concerns. So let's cut to the chase. If you want to achieve and protect your financial freedom now and in the future, it's important to develop the habit of saving early, automatically, and often. So here are some of the ways you can find extra money to put towards your savings probably heard a lot of these before. Pay yourself first. This means transferring a portion of your salary to your savings first before you start to take care of your other optional expenses. Uh, strategies like participating in the TSP plan or a healthcare savings plan are a great way to do that. Also trim spending by changing your habits. Now we all have regular habits like buying uh, you know, a coffee on the way to work or going out to lunch. Uh, probably that we could cut back on in order to save some more money. This budgeting exercise, it, we just spoke about this, and it should, it should help you to do that. Also take advantage of tax benefits. There are, are a number of ways you, you may be able to decrease the amount of tax you owe through personal or retirement savings. And finally, you can use one or more of your most important assets, time, to leverage the power of compound interest by saving earlier in life and taking advantage of interest on your interest. That's why I love delivering this particular presentation to my millennial folks, because you're younger, you have time. 
take advantage of. All right, let's talk a little bit more about compound interest. Albert Einstein called compound interest the eighth wonder of the world. Here's an example of what he meant. Okay, on this slide, in this example, uh, John, uh, Jane and John are the same age and both saved $87,500 over a 25 year period, $3,500 per year for 25 years. Jane, the earlier saver, started saving at age 25, while John, the late saver, started saving at age 40. So even though they both saved exactly the same amount over exactly the same number of years, you'll notice that by the age of 65, Jane has substantially more savings than John, $556,000 more to be exact. And this is because Jane gave her savings significantly more time to grow and she was able to take greater advantage of the power of compounding interest. So the key takeaway here is that by starting to save earlier, you can greatly impact the amount of savings you have in the longer term. If you haven't started saving already, it's never too late. But as these numbers demonstrate, the earlier you can start saving, the better off that you might be. All right, so now that you have uh, what we are, now that you know what we're aiming for, and the importance of saving, let's start building a financial infrastructure to manage your day-to-day -day expenses while working towards some of those larger long-term goals. There are three types of accounts that you're most likely going to need. All right, so the first is you, you're gonna wanna establish a way to pay your regular expenses. Get access to cash and receive payments from your employer and, and the like. This used, to be, this used to mean opening a checking account at the local bank branch, and that's still a choice, but now there's, there are other options. See, uh, payments have become increasingly electronic, so you may find that the physical location of a bank branch is less important. All right, well, keep in mind that as a rule, you wanna keep one to two months expenses on hand in these accounts, or slightly more, depending on your specific cash flows. Okay, next, you'll wanna build an emergency fund. Some may opt to, to just keep you know, more money in their simple money market accounts. Others prefer to segregate these funds by opening a separate savings account. Either way you wanna do it, just try to keep three to six months expenses on hand to cover a potential loss of income or large unexpected, unexpected expenses. Savings accounts are also where you wanna put away money for shorter term goals. So just make sure to link these savings accounts and checkings accounts uh, for convenience and reductions of any fees that the institution might charge. Now, finally, you'll wanna set up accounts for longer term goals. You all have the TSP available to you, maybe IRAs, maybe 401ks at a, at a future employer. That's a great place to start. Depending on your goals and your resources, you may also wanna consider opening uh, uh, per, per, perhaps a, a general brokerage account. So. This is a more involved discussion and it, it really has to be driven by your personal goals. And, and again, I'd be happy to speak with you about how this can all interplay at a later date. All right, so let's talk about a few issues that apply to you if you're starting out as a couple instead of on your own. So all of the account types you just discussed, except for uh, the TSP plan or retirement accounts, can either be singly or jointly owned. As you combine households, and share expenses, many couples find it more convenient to also combine bank accounts. Now, while there's certain benefits to uh, both joint and separate accounts, the right choice is the one that makes you and your partner or your spouse feel the most comfortable. Uh, the important thing is that you have a discussion early on to figure out what will cause the least friction in your relationship. For those that haven't decided, here's just a few thoughts to consider. So for separate accounts, on the upside, Many people find that having their own bank account gives them a greater sense of independence. You can spend money as you see fit without having to coordinate with your partner. Uh, also, some find that separate accounts support a more romantic relationship, you know, like allowing you to buy gifts and take each other uh, out on dates with your own money. On the other hand, separate accounts may be less convenient for paying joint expenses, like the rent bill. Some couples also find it awkward keep a running tally of who owes what. There may even be a conflict over what constitutes a joint expense and what doesn't. These might be good issues to discuss in a joint version of the budgeting exercise that we discussed earlier. 
So what's the upside of joint accounts? So as, as common expenses like mortgages and childcare costs begin to eclipse more individual expenses, joint accounts may simplify your household finances. And if only one partner works outside the home, it may also make the stay-at-home partner feel more integrated into the family finances. On the downside, full visibility into your partner's spending may not always be desirable. Like, do you really wanna know what your partner just spent on your Valentine's Day present? And joint accounts do take coordination so that the couple doesn't inadvertently start bouncing checks, okay? Of course, if you, uh, if you aren't sur sure which route is right for you, just do both. You can set up a joint account for your shared expenses and keep individual accounts for individual expenses. So now that we've, that we've saved a little money to work with, let's turn our attention to those longer term wealth goals and the investment strategies that you'll likely need to address them. This can be very broad and complex topic. So today we're just gonna cover the very basics. We're gonna look at how your, your goals and preferences become the key inputs into a disciplined investment planning process. Then we'll discuss how these inputs become an asset allocation, the heart of an investment strategy. So just a side note, here at Morgan Stanley, we've developed and refined a process we call goals planning system. And this is an integrated platform that ties goals to implementation, leveraging the intellectual capital and the sophisticated institutional capabilities of Morgan Stanley. This diagram just illustrates uh, what those individual steps look like. Let's take a closer look though at the implementation step of the goals-based planning process, which includes identifying appropriate investments. To formulate an investment strategy that helps you meet those goals, you'll need a few more pieces of information. So first, we'll have to start putting some target numbers to your goals. That can be a lump sum figure, say the money for a down payment on a house, or stream of ongoing income, like the amount of money that you need to support yourself in retirement. Of course, not all long-term goals have the same time frame. So the next step is, determine, is to determine when you need the money. Finally, you need to understand your own comfort with risk. Are you gonna be up all night worrying about every time the stock market has a bad day? Or can you live with a little more volatility in hopes of higher long-term returns? So those are the inputs. We believe that the first output should be an asset allocation. So asset allocation, this is a given mix of different asset classes, usually starting with stocks, bonds, cash, and, and something like, a, uh, or like things like money market accounts. Uh, it can also include real estate, things like commodities, hedge funds, basically anything else that has recognized value. So why would we want to include different asset classes? Well, it's because different asset classes tend to behave differently under different market conditions. The goal is to find the mix of investments that has the right risk and, re and reward characteristics for your goals, timeframes, and risk tolerance. And studies show that it's really important. As you see here at the bottom, over 90% of a portfolio's return is attributable to asset allocation. All right. So far, we've spoken about how to set goals, save some money, and invest it for the long term. But now I want to turn uh, our attention to how to use other people's money to reach your goals. So we're going to talk about improving your ability to borrow or your credit score. As we'll see, lenders are only one of the groups who might want to know about your credit worthiness. We're also going to go over how credit scores are determined and how you can raise yours. Now, your credit score is a, is a way to assess the level of financial risk associated with giving you a loan or conducting any sort of business with you. Um, on, a, on a personal note, when I was growing up, my mom was a manager at a local bank in Silver Spring, Maryland. I remember one of the first les lessons that she taught me in life, never do anything to damage your credit. So when you go to rent an apartment, the landlord will perform a credit check to assess your, your suitability as a tenant. When you try to get a cell phone, Cell phone companies can do the same thing. Bottom line, your credit score will impact most areas of your financial life. Now, there are three main suppliers of credit scores, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. And there's actually a number of scoring systems, but the most commonly referred to is your FICO score, 
that was introduced by a company called Fair Isaac and Company, F-I-C-O. Okay, so what are we looking for here? As you can see on the chart, 660 or better, preferably over 700. So how do you do that? Well, FICO scores are calculated from information contained in your credit report and grouped into five categories uh, as shown in the chart on the right there. The percentages reflect how important uh, each category is in determining your FICO score. So we all wanna have the best credit scores we can. And here are a few things you can do to improve yours. So protect and improve your credit score by paying bills on time, borrowing, but not too much. And you might think that paying your credit card bill in full every month would make you more credit worthy, but having no credit history is actually a negative. So if you've never borrowed, leave a little balance on a card for a few months before you pay it off. If you don't have a card in your name, you might want to get one with a low limit and use it responsibly. Okay, you may, and you should also regularly monitor your credit report. A lot of the banks do this, credit card companies, they do this at no cost now. You want to make sure that there's no errors and have them corrected if there are. Now, there's quite a number of websites that can help you do that. All right, so now uh, we're going to move on, and if you're if you're moving out on your own, we're, you're gonna need some place to move to. So let's discuss the relative merits of renting versus buying your home and discuss some of the steps you'll need to take advantage uh, to take regardless of which one you decide to do. So with the high cost of housing, a lot more of those in younger generations are staying at home longer. And when they do move out, it's more likely with a roommate than a spouse. And that may well be a function of people getting married later and a broader acceptance of partners living together before getting married. So that's the broad landscape, but let's talk about the choices that you have to make. So sure, owning a home is part of the American dream, but before we just assume that it's the right course of action, let's talk about some of the virtues of renting. So on the left here, obviously lower initial cost, greater flexibility, there's no market risk, and little if any maintenance cost. Uh, on the flip side, owning a home, you get the potential for appreciation and value, potential equity buildup, also tax advantages listed out there, and greater control over your personal environment. Okay, now uh, all the advantages of owning a home aren't financial. Uh, when you own a home, you have to take far more control uh, over your environment so you can expand, renovate, and redecorate as you see fit. Anyway, okay, so uh, three big takeaways. So that's uh, basically what I have to share with you today about achieving financial freedom. And yes, it has been said that most people will only remember three things from any presentation. I've thrown a lot at you today. So here are my three big takeaways. First, set clear goals for yourself. It's much easier to develop a strategy when you know what you want to accomplish. Whatever your view of a successful life may be, work toward that with purpose. Second, save. Start early and set your budget up so that you can make regular contributions towards your long-term goals. To make this easier, make the process, process as automatic as you can by enrolling the CSP, setting automatic transfers into an account, uh, like a side, set aside for long-term goals or the like. And even if you can't afford to do much, consistent contributions can yield substantial savings over time. And remember, you can increase those contributions over time. Third takeaway, uh, just careful, just be very careful with your credit score, work to improve it, protect it. Okay. Being able to demonstrate that you're a good credit risk will make it easier to borrow, save you money, and help you in many aspects of your financial life. Okay. So I would like to uh, thank you all again for your time and attention today. I recognize that there are other ways you could have spent the last half hour and that you spent it with, with me uh, is a great honor, especially if I gave you even one little bit of info that might leave you in a better position in the future. As a financial advisor who's been in the financial services industry for more than 16 years, I've had the opportunity to help many individual officers and their families develop customized investment strategies that help them achieve their long-term goals. Focus on making clients feel more informed, confident, and able to make better decisions about their investments. I'm here to help. So uh, just take note of my number and my email here. Uh, I invite you to call me, reach out, schedule a time to speak privately. I look forward to engaging with you and helping you take the next step towards achieving the financial uh, security that you've always wanted for yourself. And now, John, we have a couple minutes for questions. Happy to take some. Ash, thank you very much for the presentation. I know that for the active duty officers, 
with their security clearances, protecting the credit score is not only good for them uh, personally, for the family financially, but for their jobs as security clearances will uh, take a closer look at credit scores and financial um, risk as part of their security clearance process going forward. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about behavior, behavior change, and the idea of, you know, the, the cost of a cup of coffee or um, money that, that, you know, small changes you can make every day that would lead to compounded interest and help people get a little bit closer to some of these goals. What do you tell some of your clients? It all starts with budgeting and starts with a cash flow analysis. It's hard to do, sometimes the truth hurts. But if you can go through, you know, um, I use a personal self, uh, accounting software called Quicken. There's QuickBooks, there's Mint.com, there's, there's a number of resources out there that people can use. A lot of people just use spreadsheets. It takes time to put in all those expenses. But if you can categorize and sit down and when you realize, oh my goodness, I'm spending 2% of my monthly income or 5% or 10% on eating out, or going to concerts, or buying stuff for the house, I mean, that's eye-opening. So first is just awareness, awareness of where your money's going, and then making those hard decisions, and then trying to take the long view. Say, look, if I can dial up my contributions by 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, where do I get that money? Oh, look, I can cut down on this expense or that expense, these discretionary expenses to make that money available. That can certainly help in the long run. So it's just that analysis. That's typically the process that I go through. Yeah, and the balance, I guess, of what you want to save now for what you want later uh, to get you to, uh, you know, the balance of savings, but also living the life you love, which could be the concerts, could be the food, but uh, not to the detriment of your long-term goals. Um, yep. I wanted to open this up to anyone else on the line. If you have a question for Mr. Ashminer, please go ahead and uh, announce your name and ask your question. All right. Hearing none, I want to thank Mr. Ash Miner, Financial Advisor, Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, for your time. Thank you very much for being on another COA webinar for our members. Okay. Thanks, everyone.